Hey, welcome to Emergence uh, Winter Sessions 2020. We are in our third lesson where we're walking through our new revised statement of faith. Uh, we've looked already at our doctrine of the Bible, our doctrine of God and of Jesus. And tonight we are going to be looking at our doctrine of mankind. So uh, just a reminder, this is being pre-recorded. We're uh, not doing it live, so I'm not going to be able to pause for questions that you have. But as always, uh, I love to hear from you. My uh, email is doug.becker at emergencenj.org, and you can always feel free to write me with any questions or thoughts that you might have there. So I'm going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you uh, once again for um, the time you've given us to come together as a church and to study what you've taught us in your word tonight, what you've taught us about, your, about ourselves. Um, and I pray, Father, that uh, the outcome of tonight, Lord, would be a healthier way of looking at both ourselves and those whom we're called to reach, Father. I pray that we would really be able to integrate this stuff into um, our day-to-day -day lives and in, in how we, we view people, um, that we might see them through, through your loving eyes um, and also through your eyes of truth, Father. Um, so we ask these things and we commit this time to your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so yeah, so for this session, we're gonna be looking at what we believe about mankind, about us human beings. Uh, this is uh, sometimes called biblical anthropology. Um, as with all the other points on the statement, there's always more that can be said, but uh, we regard these things in particular as central. So let's begin by looking at what our statement says. We believe <clears throat> that all human beings are created in the image of God and are therefore valuable, worthy of dignity and respect, and accountable to God. All human beings are also guilty of sin by both nature and by choice. Sin is disobedience to the moral will of God. Sin's corrupting influence extends to every aspect of our being. As a result, all of us are in our natural state, alienated from God and under his just judgment. We are utterly unable to remedy our sinful condition and are completely dependent on God's grace in order to be born again to new life and redeemed. So the first thing that we want to say about mankind is that we are, all of us, created in the image of God. And that this is true for every human being, regardless of age or gender or ethnicity, uh, ability, spiritual status, or any other factor that has or may be used to deny human worth or dignity to someone. According to Genesis 1, God rounds off his creation on day 6 with the creation of humanity. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then the narrator adds, so God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In a few minutes, we'll consider what this means, what it means to be created in the image of God. But for our first step, let's note that this is what distinguishes us from the rest of creation. Okay? It doesn't mean that the rest of creation is unimportant, but that God singles humanity out for special importance. Unlike the earth, the astral bodies, the plants, even the animals, human beings are unique in that we are created in God's image. Moreover, the text emphasizes the, that, that this is equally true of both genders. Note the poetic parallelism in verse 27, which I've given you here in, in some color. Uh, each line develops the one before it. God created mankind, right? This is what's meant by Adam, man. Uh, that, um, he created them both in his image. And by them, we mean male and female. This above all else is what gives human beings value, 
worth, dignity, and must always remain central, especially with respect to ethical questions that evolve the treatment of one another, even those outside the household of faith. The image of God and man is passed on to all of us simply by virtue of our membership in, the hum- in, in humanity. Um, or, or perhaps we might say, simply because we are all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, uh, to use C.S. Lewis's thoughtful expression. This is evident in Genesis 5, this idea of transmission to progeny of the image of God, which begins, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man, again, Adam, when they were created. Notice the strong connections with chapter 1. When Adam, now functioning as a personal name, had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So you've got that image likeness language there. So here we see the transmission of the image and likeness of God in which Adam is created to Adam's progeny simply by virtue of human descent. And there are two other key passages that inform us on this. The first is Genesis 9, 6, which um, is part of the covenant that God establishes with Noah and with all creation after the flood. Part of this covenant is the dignity of all human beings grounded in, in this verse in the image of God explicitly. Whoever sheds the blood of man, it says, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So why is, what is the reason why killing another human being, any human being, is wrong? First and foremost, it's because you are destroying an image bearer of God. The second additional passage we might look for for this, to for this, is Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8. Speaking of mankind in general, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You gave him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet and all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. So the, so the psalmist, identified in the superscript as David, is clearly drawing on these themes that we, we saw in the biblical creation account in Genesis. In particular, the dominion that we have over the rest of creation. Now the reason I call Genesis 5, 1 through 3, Genesis 9, 6, and Psalm 8, 5 through 8 key texts for our understanding here is because they confirm for us that the image of God is indeed transmitted to all humanity without exception, okay? Moreover, think of their placement in the biblical storyline. We know what happens in Genesis 2, right? The man and the woman disobey God by eating from the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which introduces sin into God's good creation. And they're cast out of the garden, out of God's presence. And certainly this has some effect on our divine image-bearing capacity. But one thing it does not do is eradicate it or render it somehow irrelevant. Even after sin has entered into our hearts, even after all mankind, with the exception of eight people, are destroyed in God's judgment, all human beings still retain the image of God. Is it warped and effaced? Yes, you bet it is. But it still is there and it still is what sets us apart from all the rest of creation as worthy of life and honor and dignity. But now we've said a number of things about the image of God and man, but we, what we haven't done is thought about what it actually is. What does it mean to say that human beings bear the image and the likeness of God? A very common answer to that question 
is to identify some natural qualities that we seem to share with God and to fill in the blank with any number of those. After all, certainly image and likeness refers to some way that we resemble our creator. Common suggestions would include things like reason or personality or moral awareness or relational abilities or even our creativity. Think of the temptation in the garden, for example. You shall be like God, knowers of good and evil. Not necessarily a good thing. And while we certainly do share these attributes with God, questions of divine simplicity aside, it's worth asking which of these is most likely the meaning of Genesis 1, 26 through 27? Like, what does the author actually most likely have in mind here? Um, as well as the other relevant texts we've looked at. We've looked at. Like, um, how do those have a bearing on our understanding of what is actually meant in the Scripture by the image and likeness of God? Well, the Hebrew words used for image and likeness are tselem and demut, respectively. Okay? The latter, demut, um, is, which, which is the word translated likeness, typically means a copy or a picture. Like when King Ahaz made a copy of the Assyrian altar that he saw in Damascus in 2 Kings 16.10. Or like the carvings of gourds used to decorate the temple in 2 Chronicles 4.3 or pictures of Babylonian officials that artists in Judah have made of them in Ezekiel 23, 15. It's a, a, like a picture or a visual representation. And selim, or image, is interesting in that almost every time it's used in the Old Testament, it is a common word for an idol. Okay? It's not the main idol ter terminology, but it is that's, when this word is used, that's usually what it refers to. Um, certainly it's not used in the exact same sense here, right? As if we're like illicit images of the invisible God. But it does give an important clue as to what is actually being said here in Genesis. Because what, what does a graven image do? Aside from getting us in trouble if we worship them. It, it gives you an idea of what the deity is supposed to look like. Or it, it gives you a visual representation of something that is otherwise inaccessible to your eyes. But of course, biblically speaking, God is not corporeal. Corporeal, I should say. <laughs> Sometimes I read big words and pronounce them. Okay, God is not corporeal, right? He's not stuff. Like, he doesn't have a physical body. In fact, he's even sometimes called invisible. Colossians 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.17, Hebrews 11.27. And at least one of the reasons why images of him were forbidden, for example, in the second of the Ten Commandments, is because it is impossible to fashion an object that would, that would accurately capture any true aspect of who God really is. Jewish uh, commentator Nahum Sarna describes the prohibition against graven images in Exodus 20 this way. Any material representation of divinity is prohibited. A proscription elaborated in Deuteronomy 4.12 and 15-19, through 19, where it is explained that the people heard the sound of words at Sinai, but perceived no shape, nothing but a voice. In the Israelite view, any symbolic representation of God must necessarily be both inadequate and a distortion, for an image becomes identified with what it represents and is soon looked upon as the place and presence of the deity. In the end, the image itself will become the locus of reverence and an object of worship, all of which constitutes the complete nullification of the singular essence of Israelite monotheism. And yet, there are images of God, which God himself have made. There are, in fact, 7.8 billion of them running around right now in the world. So what does it mean to say that God has created his own selim, his own image, his own demut or likeness? Well, interestingly, 
for at least the past 70 years now, Old Testament scholars have identified an impressive number of ancient Near Eastern texts, both Egyptian and Mesopotamia. These are texts from around the time and place of the Old Testament, um, <clears throat> in which kings are explicitly called or strongly implied to be images of their gods, sometimes even using the noun psalmu to describe them, which is the Akkadian form of the word that's used, selim, in the Bible. But here in Genesis 1, there is an important innovation on this theme. It is all individual human beings, not just the king, who are said to be in the image of God. This royal flavor to the image of God is also confirmed by the mandate that's given immediately after we're created. What are we supposed to do? Have dominion over the fish and the birds and every living thing that moves on the earth. We're, we're to be little rulers here. Notice also that a part of this formula is repeated in God's words to Noah in chapter 9, which con confirms it, right? So the, the idea seems to be that we, as God's image bearers, are to rule God's creation as his representatives. <clears throat> and this is actually rounded out by another related concept that is illustrated well in an inscription found at Tel el Fakariah in Syria. Yes, that is the pronunciation of it. So this is a basalt stature, statue of a king named Hadad Yithi with an inscription carved on its skirt. And it dates to about 850 BC. The inscription is bilingual. It is both Akkadian and Aramaic. In fact, it's the earliest known Aramaic inscription. And here's what it says. And note that the Aramaic contains the same two nouns that describe humanity in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. The image, the demut, of Hadad Yithi, which he has set up before Hadad of Sikhan. The statue, Tselem, of Hadad Yithi, king of Guzan and Sikhan and of Azran, for exalting and continuing his throne. This image, Demut, he made better than before in the presence of Hadad, who dwells in Sikhan, the lord of Habor. He has set up this statue, this Tselem. Okay, so in case the idea is not clear, what's going on here? So, Hadad Yithi or Adad Yithi is a king. And the seat of his kingdom is Guzana. It's called Gozan in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the statue was found at the mo modern archaeological site. Um, and that site is the ancient city of Sikon. And so, Hadad Yithi, right, reigning from Guzana... Um, this is an Aramaic, Aramean kingdom. Uh, in the Bible, the Arameans are called Syrians for reasons, that, um, but that's what they're called. So, so anyway, he's, the, he's an Aramean king reigning in Guzana, and he erects this statue, this selim, this demut, there in the city of Sikon, where it has been found by archaeologists, in order to exalt his throne there. In other words, the fact that the image, the likeness was there meant that everyone who gazed upon it were expected to draw the same conclusion. Hadad Yithi reigns here. And so based on the strength of this parallel, as well as some of the other evidence that I've mentioned, the concept of the likeness of God throughout the ancient Near East, uh, the creation mandate that occurs in two different places, the likeness is, is uh, terminology is used. The most likely interpretation of this biblical concept, the image of God or imago dei as it's come to be known, is that each and every one of us represents God's rule over his creation. And so, we are expected to live in such a way that reflects his kinship to one another and to all created things. The image of God in man, in man is the inherent right and responsibility possessed by all human beings 
to exercise dominion in God's name over God's creation. Theologian Gerhard von Rad puts it this way. He, meaning man, is really only God's representative, summoned to maintain and enforce God's claim to dominion over the earth. <clears throat> In sum, then, the image of God bestows on us both dignity and value, as well as accountability for, to the one whose rule we are here to represent. From this, we can see easily the many ways in which our sin effaces this image. Um, now, as I said earlier, and many other times before this, the image of God in us is what gives human beings dignity, value, worth, and provides the foundation for any biblical view of justice. Uh, it is also, as we say in our statement of faith, okay, uh, it, it also means that we are first and foremost accountable to God. Our lives are given to us by him and they are defined by him. He is the one who determines what each and every one of us will be. And in order to truly flourish, we must live in accordance with that purpose. By redefining different aspects of our humanity, including our gender, our sexuality, our purpose, or anything else, we are usurping the role of God and treating our bodies not as something received by the Lord and Creator who loves us, but something that we can just redefine as w at will, that we can just assign our own meaning to in accordance with our own fallen and twisted desires. Any attempt to achieve a just society requires that we begin with the image of God in us. And that requires that if, th that if this is understood or ignored, so will be our understanding of flourishing and of justice. Coupled with the immense honor and dignity with which humanity is endowed, uh, of, of course, is going to be always the reality of sin. And in our statement of faith, sin is defined as disobedience to the moral will of God. While there are certainly different categories of sin, most famously sins of commission and sins of omission, um, or, for example, inadvertent sin and high-handed sin, <clears throat> it is important for us to understand that the primary party offended in all our sin is God. This is not to deny the tremendous harm that sin obviously does uh, to, to one another, to other people, uh, and even to creation in general. But without minimizing that, we need to say that the wrongness of sin it does not stem from the damage it does to created things, but from the twisting of our nature away from being worshipers of God to being our own gods. It, it's primarily a theological, not an anthropological thing. Our attempts to become like God uh, to use the terminology of Genesis 3. Three quick biblical examples serve to reinforce this point, that the primary party who is offended and, um, and I don't want to say hurt, but uh, against whom sin is, is God. Um, the first is the triviality of the archetypical sin committed by our first parents in the Garden of Eden. So, Many have wondered at the almost silly prohibition against simply eating a piece of fruit. Like, why, why something so otherwise morally significant? Um, I mean, usually fruit isn't sinful. Unless, of course, you're getting ready to film a winter session and you, uh, your friend, knowing that you're blinded by lights or perhaps not realizing that, decides to throw an orange squarely at your head and knocks off your glasses. <laughs> That's what happened to me like five seconds before we started filming. And uh, I love that guy. Uh, but yeah, usually fruit isn't used in sin. Um, is God just being petty? 
On the contrary, no. It is the very simplicity of the fruit that is the point. Had God issued a command about something more morally obvious or more, uh, let's say, obviously outrageous, such as murder or rape or theft or something like that, and had they fallen to this, then it would have been possible for anyone who's not committed such acts or any other examples we might cite to reason, well, then what happened in the garden doesn't really apply to me because I'm not like that. I'm not that bad. But the fact that the object of temptation is something so seemingly inconsequential forces us to look not upon the destructive nature of the act, but rather on the, or like, like, or what it does, right? Like what it's, um, uh, the, the people it hurts or something like that, right? But, but rather on the mere fact of disobedience to God's command. The big deal about the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil then is precisely that the fruit was not a big deal. What is a big deal is that the humans had a clear command from God and they chose through their own wisdom, through their own desire uh, to ignore the command and instead to go with their own evaluation of what is right and wrong for them. It was disobedience to the moral will of God that was at issue there. That's what makes sin, sin. Or we might look to Genesis 39, a story with which many of us are, I'm sure, familiar. Here, Joseph, enslaved in the Egyptian household of his master Potiphar, is being pursued sexually by Potiphar's wife. And what is his response to his advances. You know, she's like, come lay with me. And what does he say? And it seems pretty clear where he's going at first. Behold, he tells her, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. And, and what do we expect him to say next? Something perhaps along the lines of, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against your husband? But no, what does he say? He says, how then can I do this great w- wickedness and sin against God? Again, this is not a, to deny that the harm that, that such an affair uh, would have been to Potiphar, right? That this would have devastated him and it would have in very real sense been a sin against him but rather what this is is an acknowledgement that sin before it is against anyone and anything else is against God a uh, final example to drive home this point <clears throat> Psalm 51 written by King David and this is a great psalm of repentance by the way that should drive all of our prayer in turning away from our sin And look what he says in verses 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Okay, so David acknowledges he sinned against God here, right? But but rewind now to a a few lines to the superscript of the psalm, the introductory words. And check out the historical context in which he's praying this prayer. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now that puts quite a different spin on things, doesn't it? Think of all the people harmed by David and what he did. First, there was Bathsheba, the married woman whom David slept with who probably had little choice in the matter. Then there was her husband, Uriah, whom David had killed. And there was his people. He's he's responsible to lead an entire kingdom in a godly way. As my teacher in seminary, D.A. Carson, is fond of saying when he talks about this, it's difficult to think of anyone against whom David hadn't sinned. And yet, 
in full acknowledgement of all the harm that was done, David can speak here in Psalm, in Psalm 51 as if God is the only offended party. And why? Well, by not, while not denying that repentance and sorrow has to be aimed at those whom we have personally wronged on a human level, right? It's because, as we've been saying, the primary offended party in all our sin is God. Now, <clears throat> we talk about the moral will of God. And I think it's important that when we do, we acknowledge that God's moral will is expressed, of course, in his written revelation to us. But also, it's something that we perceive by nature. That is, through the moral reasoning with which God has equipped all of us. So we see here in uh, Romans 2, 12 through 16. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So let's be quick to realize here that Paul, what is said by Paul is part of his wider argument about the universal sinfulness of all mankind, where he shows that no one, whether Jew or Gentile, is exempt from God's judgment owing to our sin. To be sure, at this point in the letter of Romans, he, his discourse is actually specifically directed at a Jewish audience that feels superior to Gentiles. And so he talks about how sometimes Gentiles who typically do not have a knowledge of God's written law, the, the Torah, do what the law requires, as he says. This, he says, shows that the work of the law is written on their hearts, with their conscience functioning as sort of a moral barometer that ev evaluates their actions for which they are also in turn ultimately held accountable to God. I say this because we need to remember that Paul is not saying here that Gentiles, or some Gentiles at least, have somehow figured out the secret sauce of how to earn their way into heaven. Okay, read chapter 3, the rest of, uh, read chapter 3 in Romans uh, if, you, if you doubt that. Um, he's simply saying that certain Jewish people whom he has in mind need to slow their roll because there are some Gentiles who don't even have the written law who do a better job at keeping it than they do. And so, whereas I think we would obviously agree that the moral will of God is expressed in Scripture, there is also a very real sense in which human beings, even operating apart from God's special revelation in the Bible, um, have a sense of right and wrong that can, to varying degrees, line up with God's revealed will in the Scripture. And so, it should be no surprise to us that people who are far from God, even sometimes those who don't believe at all, still know right from wrong in a lot of circumstances, still can be very good, very moral people. At the same time, however, as we see, the presence of sin in our hearts always taints our righteous works. And if I may beat the same drum again that I did yesterday in the sermon, okay, what, how do we see that? Well, Jesus taught us that the first and greatest commandment was to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves. So when even morally upright acts are done in unbelief, there will always be and almost inevitably be a very strong undercurrent of sin there as well. <clears throat> 
This is especially true in sin that includes not only what we do, but also what we fail to do. And also, not only that, but the posture of our hearts is important also. Think about like the Ten Commandments. Okay, you've got some very tangible, checklisty actions there. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. But then you get the tenth. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. Coveting. That is the desire for something that God does not want you to have is not an outward thing. I can't look, aha, I knew you were coveting, right? No, Uh, at, at, at least not in its root form. Okay? It's rather the attitude of the heart that leads us to violate some of those other commandments, like uh, to steal, I covet my neighbor's ox or donkey, or to commit adultery, I covet his wife. Um, and that attitude in itself, too, is sin, this is telling us. Other examples of this inward heart sin that might be the kinds of things, uh, might be the kinds of things that uh, Jesus talks about, like in Matthew tap, chapter 5, like what he does with the, some of the commandments there. So here we find that it isn't just murder that God hates, but rather also the anger in our hearts. In fact, he redefines murder as being angry with your brother. And it isn't just physically sleeping with your buddy's wife that God hates, but it's looking at any other person with lustful intent. And of course, uh, as we've already seen, the primary commandments which sum up the law and the prophets, the command to love the Lord and our neighbors, uh, these two are attitudes in our hearts. So sin is a very inward thing. It's, It's not just, and maybe even not even primarily outward actions. That's just kind of like the spillover when we release it into the physical world, right? Um, The corruption of sin extends to the whole human race. There is no human being for whom this does not apply. In a sense, the entire biblical storyline and our entire life experience proves this to be true. But there are also a good number of passages that directly attest to the universal sinfulness of all mankind. When God before the flood, surveyed the earth. Genesis 6, 5 tells us that he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And as a result, God sent a great flood upon the earth, essentially decreating and recreating everything that he had made, sparing only Noah and his family. But even that incredible act of judgment didn't eradicate sin. Because then, after the flood had run its course, in the midst of God's gracious covenant with Noah and all humanity, he says, I will never again curse the ground because of uh, man. And then he adds immediately, although the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. I translate uh, the particle key there, although, as most commentators do, uh, which is probably more accurate than the English Standard Version's uh, four. The point being, (laughs) therefore, in uh, Genesis 8.21, that despite the evil that still lies at the heart of man, God's disposition will be gracious. What is sometimes called common grace. I'll never again destroy the earth, although the same thing is still happening that kind of instigated the flood in the first place. There are many other passages to this effect as well. So for example, Solomon in his prayer at the dedication of the temple acknowledges there is no one who does not sin, 1 Kings 8, 46. Isaiah, in his climactic suffering servant song in chapter 53, says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's Isaiah 53, 6. And 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And Paul in Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Probably the most hard-hitting passage on this, though, 
occurs at the beginning of that chapter, the beginning of Romans 3, where he writes, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. None, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, <laughs> so sin is a universal thing among humanity. Uh, now, there's little question that we're sinners by choice. Every time we choose to disobey the moral will of God, which we are aware of, both through Scripture and through our own internal moral compasses, warped although they are, what we are doing is we are essentially agreeing with the choice made by our first parents in the garden. That we are the ones who have authority over our own lives to determine what is right for us and what is wrong for us. And that God's commands and his glory count for very little. But we also want to affirm the biblical view that we are sinners also by nature. By this we mean that we are born into a state of spiritual death and alienation from God. So when we say in our statement that all human beings are guilty of sin, both by nature and by choice, we are saying that when we choose to disobey God's moral will, we are acting in accord with our fallen nature. Paul describes this in the following way at the beginning of Ephesians 2. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in what you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by, children nature, uh, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So that daily choice that we make to walk in trespass and in sins and to live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the desires of the mind is in accord with the state of spiritual death. And notice that he says that we are children of wrath by nature. Another big way the Bible describes this is by saying that we are in Adam. Now, the classic text for this is Romans 12, uh, 12, 5, 12 through 21, 5, 12 through 21, um, which is a beautiful, which is a very beautiful passage in the way that it sets up Jesus's life-giving work on the cross as this, as this counter to Adam's death-bringing choice in the garden. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read it in its entirety. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the trespass of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's keep in mind that we're talking here about the doctrine of humanity, and in particular, the doctrine of sin. So, because there's obviously a lot more here uh, that would contribute to a robust understanding of salvation as well. Um, and we're going to talk, be talking about salvation next week. Um, so I'm, I'm not looking to extract, in other words, the sum total of all that Paul is saying here. Notably, the powerful effects of Christ's work on encountering the powerful effects of Adam's sin. Um, The question we're seeking to answer, though, because we're on this topic of sinners by nature, um, is what is it exactly that we inherit from Adam's fall into sin? Is it only our sinful nature, which we have seen as a very biblical concept, or is there something else as well? Namely, do we somehow inherit Adam's guilt? The idea would be that Adam, standing as the federal representative of all humanity, chose to disobey God and that the guilt of having done that is then imputed to us to the extent that even people who would otherwise be innocent, for example, say babies that that tragically pass away in infancy, even them, they are morally guilty and culpable before God because they are in Adam. To put it succinctly, all who are within the bounds of little o orthodox Christianity believe that we are born with a sinful nature, a spiritual deadness that inclines us away from what God wants and towards sin. But some also believe that we are born judicially guilty of the sin of Adam. Well, the first thing we want to say about this is that we don't take a position on that in our statement of faith. Um, In our estimation, the question of imputed guilt is not central enough to the Christian faith to warrant inclusion in a core statement of beliefs. And emergence is not unique in this respect. Um, Just to name a few ministries that are strongly reformed, and a lot of uh, reformed thinkers do hold to imputed guilt, um, Uh, I would think of R.C. Sproul's Ligonier Ministries, James White's Alpha and Omega Ministries, uh, John MacArthur's Church, Grace Church. Look at all their statements of faith. None of them include something about imputed guilt, at least not explicitly. So um, even though, if I'm not mistaken, at least two of these uh, ministries and maybe three do teach it. Um, But it is out there. And it is commonly enough believed to be part of our sinful nature that I should say something about it. So what I'm going to give right now is my personal take on the issue, not emergence's official stance. Again, many prominent reformed ministries do not have an official stance on this either in their core doctrinal statement. Um, Romans 5 is indeed, what I just read, is indeed purported to be the key text from which a doctrine of imputed guilt is derived. And yet, my personal contention, and many would agree with me, is that nowhere in this passage is imputed guilt actually taught. So let me highlight the places where it's alleged to be and just give a few words. The first is in the very beginning in verse 12. Death spread to all men because all sinned. So the reason why death spread to all men is explicitly said to be because all sinned. It is the purposeful act of sin, according to this verse, that spreads death to all human beings without exception. 
In other words, it is by virtue of our, our own conscious decisions to sin that we show ourselves to be in agreement with Adam's sin. However, it takes several additional assumptions to arrive at the idea that this is saying that Adam's guilt is imputed to us. It doesn't, simply doesn't say that. A trickier phrase is in verse 15. Many died through one man's trespass. Yet notice that here too, Paul does not explain the mechanism by which this happens. He doesn't say that we die because the one man's trespass is counted to us. He simply says that we die through it, which I think we have to admit is a vague way to put it. The same goes for this a similar statement made in verse 17. Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Paul in this statement does not explain how it came to be that death reigned because of Adam's trespass, only that it did. One must read the idea of imputed guilt into this passage in order to get it to say that. And the same goes for verse 18. One trespass led to condemnation for all men. Again, how? How does one trespass lead to condemnation for all men? It at least seems, it seems at least reasonable to say that it does because all people born after Adam inherit a sinful nature and act sinfully in accordance with that nature. Likewise, verse 19, as by one man's disobedience, though many were made sinners. This too sounds a lot more like an inherited fallen nature than it does imputed guilt with inherited fallen nature being at least more plausible on two accounts. First, whatever it is that he's talking about that is acting upon us to make us sinners, it, it, whatever it is, it's acting upon us to make us sinners, okay? Um, it's not, not merely making us guilty of inherited sin. And second, inherited sinful nature is is, is part of, sin, of Paul's uh, sin theology elsewhere, whereas inherited guilt is not. It's nowhere else clearly taught. Um, and this, I think, serves... The reason I kind of go off on this tangent is because I know people wonder about it, um, but it's also a very important aspect of our theological method. Okay, that is, Scripture must be the source of our doctrine. We don't begin by assuming doctrines and then reading them into Scripture, but rather by drawing them out through standard methods of interpretation. Call it hermeneutics, call it exegesis. A good question to ask is whether someone with no prior knowledge of the doctrine, the doctrine that we're trying to prove would simply read the text and then come away believing the doctrine in question. And I can see no way, and not for lack of trying, that strict grammatical exegesis of Romans 5 would lead me to think that God imputes the guilt of Adam to all of Adam's prosperity. One might be able to make the case, were the doctrine taught clearly elsewhere in Scripture, but this is the main text cited by its proponents, and, um, and for these reasons, it seems to be quite unavoidable to say that Romans 5 cannot yield the doctrine of imputed guilt without engaging in eisegesis, without reading into the text more than Paul actually says, without reading into the text what we might actually even want to find there for one reason or another, rather than reading out of the text the meaning that Paul most likely intended and say when he's ambiguous— that he's ambiguous and not trying to fill in the blanks with a doctrine that's not taught elsewhere in Scripture. So that's my personal take on it. Um, another important aspect of the biblical understanding of sin is sometimes uh, called total depravity. And uh, that was actually the phraseology of our original statement of faith. But even though uh, that is the standard kind of theological jargon that would be used for that, we opted for what we feel is a clearer way to say this, to explain the same thing. And so our revised statement reads, Sin's corrupting influence extends to every aspect of our being. So when we look at Scripture, we see that sin's corrupting effect, uh, effects influence our all of our humanity, all of it, all of me, okay? 
Paul in Romans 7, 18 goes so far as to say, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Uh, This includes our intellect, our will, our affections, our conscience, our bodies. Um, Sin's effect on our intellect, also sometimes called the noetic effects of sin from the Greek word naeo, which means uh, to think. Um, uh, that's, that's where we get that from, the noetic effects of sin. Um, and a passage we've already read, uh, Romans 1.21, um, speaks to this effect. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Um, notice, futile in their thinking. Or 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. He can't, even, he can't understand them. These are thinking words. Or Ephesians 4, 17 through 18. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. And finally, Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the unbelieving and uh, the, the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Notice how in interconnected everything is like everything's like attached to these noetic effects of sin um our our wills our conscience our emotions our our affections right all together in one jumbled mess bent towards sin and really feeding one another my affections my desires are messed up and so my thinking comes into service of them, dictating what I think is plausible and reasonable. Like, like I really want to do this, so you know, maybe I don't have any good reasons to think that God is there. You know? but, but, I, but I reason falsely about what is truly right and good and desirable. And then what does that do? That throws my affections off. So there's this, just this vicious circle going, going on in, in, our, in, our, in ourselves, in our, in our hearts. Uh, and in our minds, um, a good illustration of this is First Peter 1.14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay? So the passions that drive us towards sin are characterized by what? Ignorance. A lack of knowledge. So this, what does this do? It, it blunts my will. My ability to say no to sinful desires. And it makes me a slave to them. This is why the Bible uses the metaphor of slavery and bondage to describe our sinful nature in our natural pre-Christ unregenerate state. We are, as Paul says in Romans 6, slaves of sin, which lead, leads to death. Of course, we heard the good news about this um, in the message I was uh, blessed to give yesterday, um, but... Um, Alas, we're talking about the doctrine of sin right now, so not quite there yet in these lessons. Um, and what happens is eventually our consciences become seared. We're, we're unable to truly discern what is right and what is honorable, let alone to desire it. To the pure, Titus 1.15 says, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. And this affects even our physical bodies. As Paul writes in Romans 8, 10, the body is dead because of sin. Uh, And then later on in the chapter, of course, he talks about the the fact that we, along with the rest of creation, are in bondage to corruption, to the the wasting and and to the death that pervades our world, which we saw in chapter 5 is here because of sin. In fact, a lot of these passages paint a picture of sin that is more comprehensive than what we sometimes think, the way we sometimes think of sin. Sin corrupts the entirety of who we are. So this needs to stand alongside of this more typical way that we tend to think about sin, what I sometimes call the laundry list view of sin. And that's the idea that there are a lot of sins, uh, plural, 
right? And, and that every time I do one of those, that, that's a check against me. To be sure, the Bible does speak in that way, right? Whether it's individual laws in the Old Testament or like New Testament vice lists. Um, but we get this a lot. Uh, but the comprehensive picture that we get throughout the Bible is that sin is not merely about doing a lot of good and morally neutral things and then just sprinkled with some bad sinful stuff that we occasionally do or even maybe do a lot, right? It's not, it's not that. No, everything is corrupted by sin. It's like leaven. It's worked its way through our, every aspect of our being. And that's why we have to balance our desire to avoid particular sins against this more realistic picture of how sick our hearts actually are. Let's say, for example, that I see an attractive woman and I want to I look at her and think things that I shouldn't, but I also want to follow Christ. Um, and in that moment, God gives me the strength to not, uh, to, to, to not dishonor him, to not dishonor, dishonor my wife, to not dishonor myself. Okay? Ha, have I sinned if I say no to that desire? In a sense, no, I didn't sin because I didn't look at her in a way that, that, that was sinful. But in another sense, why did I feel such a strong desire to do that in the first place? Is it not because my intellect, my will, my affections, my conscience is permeated by a sinful nature that draws me away from the things of God and to the things of hell? This nature that was in place when I was born and then strengthened by decades of me choosing to follow my sin rather than God. So while it is a good thing that I can resist temptation sometimes, I shouldn't kid myself that that somehow makes me a righteous person. Okay, only Jesus does that. And, and this holds true both for believers as well as for unbelievers, that these things do not make me a righteous person. Um, although in the case of believers, we'd want to likewise balance this with the truth that I've said of freedom from sin resulting from my death to it. Um, but that's, I think, a more comprehensive idea of what, what sin is. It's not about like, oh, am I sinning now? Am I not sinning? No, like everything is tainted. The whole thing is like, is is fallen. Um, uh, uh, another common misconception about uh, total depravity is that we're saying that all human beings are as bad as they can be. I feel like we all, you always have to mention this when you mention total depravity. Um, not so. As I've already indicated, it is certainly true that people, even those who don't know the Lord, could do many good things. Um, total depravity simply means that sin permeates every aspect of our being and that it makes it impossible to uh, respond positively to God's grace. As a result, God justly stands in judgment against each and every one of us. This is a function of God's holiness and of his justice. God takes sin very seriously. In fact, one of the harder things for people to get their head around is exactly how seriously God does take it. But what is absolutely critical to remember is that we come to this question with an extremely limited knowledge about how evil we are and about how our evil impacts the world. And this goes for both the things that we shouldn't do that we, that, that, that we do anyway, and the things that we're morally obligated to do, but don't. It, it isn't difficult to envision a small bit of the damage that failure to love our neighbors, both close and worldwide, has on God's good creation, especially our fellow image bearers. Like, what would this world look like if we all truly did what God wants us to do? And that's just the harm to, that, to, fail, to, to, 
the, the, that comes from the failure to follow the second commandment, right? To love one's neighbor. And remember how we said that the one who's wronged even more than that is God himself. And when we affront his infinite glory. You may also recall how in our study of the doctrine of God, we talked about how God's all-knowingness, his omniscience, means that he has perfect knowledge of all morally significant acts. He knows perfectly how wrong each wrong is and how right each right is. We don't. Even in evaluating one another's sins, yes, some sin is more conspicuous, maybe more outwardly destructive, right? Maybe a guy wrecks his family because he chooses to do something. But we don't really know the depths of people's hearts, what's swimming around in there. And, and any act of rebellion that manifests itself outwardly is likely only the tip of the iceberg compared to the twisted perversion of the heart that produces such acts. And so we are in no position to question God's judgment. We know neither the true standard of holiness nor the amount of evil that dwells within us or anyone else, nor our true level of culpability for our evil acts, nor the destructive results of those evils. All critical things to know in order to make judgments as to whether or not a person is worthy of God's judgment. How are we supposed to know that? Human penal systems vary widely on punishment deserved uh, by, wildly, by widely uh, acknowledged crimes. How can we expect to know what is truly a just retribution for any particular act of sin, let alone all of the sin that we do not accurately perceive? What we do know is that God's judgment is righteous and just. As Abraham prayed as he had interceded for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And Psalm 50 verse 6 tells us, the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. And Psalm 89 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Psalm 96 10 and 13, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. He will judge the peoples with equity. And in Habakkuk, I'm sorry, in Habakkuk 1.13, the prophet addresses the Lord as, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. God's just judgment is one of the most consistent themes of Scripture. And we should remember, as I mentioned last week, that Jesus himself is the one appointed to sit at, uh, in, uh, as judge on the day when God judges the world. In Acts 17, 30, uh, 17 verses 30 and 31, Paul sums up the situation well. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness and judgment by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And this leaves us in the place where we end our remarks about mankind in our statement of faith. We are utterly unable to remedy our sinful condition and are completely dependent on God's grace in order to be born again to new life and redeemed. And it is to that redemption that we will turn next week when we look together what the Bible has to teach us about the atonement. See you then.